In this episode, I summarize Huberman's toolkit for optimal sleep, including behaviors and supplements, as well as a guide on when and how to use them. If you're new here, I'm Dr. Sinan, GP and longevity doctor with health tips to help you live better and longer. Let's get to it. Light, dark, temperature, food, exercise, caffeine, supplements, digital tools, these are all things that can either help or hinder our sleep. They're all forms of cues to our brain and body. We interact with most of these things on a daily basis, so we may as well do them in a way that's health promoting. I've broken these down into morning and evening type behaviors. You need a drop in temperature, about one to three degrees for your body to enter a state of sleep. The opposite is also true. If your body temperature rises by one to three degrees, you're likely to wake up. This increased body temperature triggers waking up and it's usually associated with an increase in cortisol. When it's elevated at the right time, i.e. first thing in the morning, cortisol enhances your immune system, enhances your metabolism and your ability to focus and your ability to move your body. You want cortisol to reach its peak right about the time that you wake up. To leverage this temperature effect to feel more awake, what you can do is try and increase your core body temperature quickly by taking a cold shower or an ice bath for maybe one to three minutes or so. This triggers adrenaline and a dopamine release and it increases that core body temperature. Any movement, and it doesn't have to be full-blown exercise, will increase core body temperature too, especially done early in the day. The best time to exercise if your goal is to optimize gains is immediately after waking. If you work out in the afternoon, it may be worth taking a hot shower or a bath to try and decrease your body's temperature and help prepare your body for sleep. Seeing bright sunlight within about 30 to 60 minutes after waking triggers a cortisol increase early in the day. And that's exactly when we want it to peak and it sets your body for sleep later that night. If there's cloud cover and you can't see the sun, you still want to get outside and get some of that natural light. There are three tips that are particularly useful for viewing bright light early in the day. Try and look toward the sun without glasses and not through the windshield of a car in the first 30 to 60 minutes of waking. This has a really powerful impact on the ability to fall asleep and stay asleep later that night. You need about five minutes a day on a clear day and obviously don't stare directly at the sun. It's towards the sun. Try also to get outside, even on cloudy days. You need about 10 minutes if it's cloudy and maybe about 20 minutes or so if it's overcast. If it's dark because of cloudiness or the time of day that you wake up, do flip on the artificial lights in your house but go outside as soon as the sun's out or use something like a ring light. Aim to see sunlight first thing in the morning, about 80% of the time. This is quite a lot, pretty much six out of seven days a week. If you miss a day, try and get twice as much duration of light the next day. If you get really obsessed with sunlight, some apps can help you measure the quality of sunlight, but it's really not necessary and also not something to get super obsessed about. By the way, part of Huberman's morning protocol is to skip for about 10 to 20 minutes while viewing the sun and taking a cold shower thereafter. It takes the light and the temperature behaviors nicely. Caffeine is a psychoactive stimulant that increases dopamine and it blocks something called adenosine. Adenosine is the chemical that builds up during the day and makes us feel sleepy. With caffeine, you get a hit from the dopamine, but as it gets broken down, the effects wear off and the level of adenosine that you suppress starts to come rushing through. This is known as a caffeine crash. Two tips can help here. Try and delay your caffeine intake for about one and a half to two hours after waking to avoid this afternoon crash. It's best to allow natural signals to wake up the body by delaying caffeine intake for about 90 minutes or so after rising. If you want your caffeine first thing in the morning before exercising, you'll likely get a bit of an afternoon dip in energy, so do plan accordingly. Avoid drinking caffeine after 4 p.m. If you must have some, try and limit it to about 100 milligrams or less. Personally, I advise my clients not to drink after midday, but the principle is the same. The dose and the timing of coffee is what makes it helpful or harmful. Remember, caffeine has a half-life of about five to six hours, which means half of the caffeine is broken down in about six hours. That still leaves a quarter in the system about 12 hours later. And if you do take caffeine late and don't think it affects you, it probably does, especially your deep sleep, which is difficult to register. 
Huberman isn't very prescriptive about food compared to the other behaviors, but it's worth heeding a few principles. Eating early in the day increases metabolism and temperature. This is good. It can make you feel more alert and it can help set and train your circadian clock. This is good. On the flip side though, if you eat a large meal first thing in the morning, it makes you feel tired and sluggish by diverting blood and resources away from the brain. So do try and eat in the morning, but don't eat too much and try to eat at a similar time if possible. Alcohol is not strictly food here, but it is empty calories and there is no dispute that it's seriously disruptive for sleep. It may help you fall asleep, but it warps the quality and the restorative nature of sleep. I'll cover this in a bit more detail on my summary episode about alcohol and health. It definitely deserves its own airtime, so keep an eye out for that. Even better, do subscribe, hit that bell, and help me keep these practical summaries coming your way. Fasting is a gray area here. Huberman's advice is to do what feels right. Food is something that affects our cues for sleep, but it's not the most important behavior. I've done a lot of fasting in my time, and my personal experience is that when I've done a 24-hour war fast, it tends to wreck my sleep. Time-restricted feeding, however, i.e. not eating for about 16 to 20 hours a day, maybe having two meals in the day, has actually helped my sleep. Huberman didn't actually talk about this much, but there is a neurotransmitter called orexin A, which is linked to alertness, which has been shown to increase in the day for intermittent fasters and tends to decrease at night and helps with sleep. Either way, see what works for you, play around with it. One more point on navigating weekends. We're not machines. Our lives can be regimented, but for most of us, it's punctuated by chaos, kind of the uncontrolled, the unexpected, and sometimes we just want to go rogue. If that's the case, but in the back of your mind, you don't want to completely decimate your sleep, maybe try not to sleep or wake more than an hour beyond your usual schedule. Instead of sleeping in, maybe schedule a short nap in the day. If you wake up at a regular time but have slept late, this is the case for me most days, wait to ingest caffeine by about 90 minutes to a, to a couple of hours after waking to avoid that disruption of your body's natural compensatory sleep mechanism. If you do all of the above, hopefully you should be primed for sleep without the need for supplements. Here are a few other nighttime behavioral tools to help you stay asleep and to get you back to sleep if you do wake up. You can try things like eye masks, earplugs. There's a bit of a personal preference here and it's context dependent. They're great to block out noise, but it can be really annoying when you hear your own heartbeat in your head. Maybe even try elevating the foot of your bed by about three to five degrees or using something like a pillow. This helps with lymphatic drainage, which helps with something called glymphatic washout. This basically improves the self-clearing or the drainage that occurs in the brain every night and it can improve wakefulness and cognition as a result the next day. If you wake up in the night and you can't get back to sleep, you could try things like the Reverie app, which is a kind of self-hypnosis tool with a specific get back to sleep protocol. Make sure you dim your phone if you're going to be reaching for that in the middle of the night. You can also use other online sleep-focused tools like Yoga Nidra or something called NSDR techniques to relax you back into slumber. Google them and have a go. As always, try behavioral tools before diving into supplements. If you want to give it a go, or feel the need, here's Huberman's recommendations broken down into everyday options and every now and again options. Huberman also recommends single ingredient supplements so you can figure out what's actually helping and develop a bit more of a customizable and scientific approach to optimizing your sleep. With these, it makes sense to try one, see what it does before adding in others. There are quite a few different forms of magnesium. It's actually downright confusing. The main take home here is that three and eight is best for sleep because it's the best form of magnesium to cross the blood-brain barrier, which allows it to have more of a direct relaxation and anti-anxiety effect on the brain. If you do try this, about 5% or so of people have stomach issues, so do be mindful if you start this. Take 145 milligrams 30 to 60 minutes before sleep. This is a naturally occurring amino acid that can also help relax the brain and decrease acute stress and anxiety. It can also take the edge off and balance the peaks and troughs of caffeine intake. Avoid this if you get night terrors, or you sleepwalk, it can make both of those things worse. Take 100 to about 400 milligrams about one hour before sleep. Apigenin is a flavonoid from the chamomile plant. It's a safe compound, but it can cause sedation if the dose is too large. So stick to a low dose, about 50 milligrams once a day, about an hour before sleep. Huberman uses these types of supplements maybe every third or fourth night before sleep. But like all supplements, none are necessary unless you're keen to give it a go. This one is an amino acid 
acid that activates the NMDA receptor in the brain, which helps to promote sleep. This is one of the main inhibitory neurotransmitters in the brain. And when we activate this, it promotes relaxation. This is a kind of copy of glucose and it affects some of the signaling pathways. It's sleep promotive and it's really useful for falling asleep again if you wake up. If you do use it, only take it every other night and don't take it on the nights when you take glycine and GABA. What about the things to avoid? This is a really common sleep aid used worldwide. Huberman doesn't really advocate the use of this. He feels that the over-the-counter doses are way too high for the body, especially kids, and for any type of chronic use, especially as a copy of a hormone that's naturally produced in the body that helps to regulate your sleep rhythm. This is an over-the-counter drug in many parts of the world. Where I practice in the UK, it's a prescribable drug only. You can't buy it over-the-counter, and it's only given for a very few reasons. He also doesn't advocate other commonly prescribed sleep drugs like benzodiazepines or so-called Z drugs as they worsen the sleep architecture. The quality of sleep with THC and CBD tends to be worse than when you're not taking it. The only caveat here is if anxiety is the underlying issue affecting your sleep, then it may actually be helpful. This brings us on to the final point. If you do have sleep difficulties, then you need to seek help. There are common conditions, most notably things like depression that can make it very difficult to fall asleep, stay asleep, or even wake up in the first place. It's great to try some of these tools that we've talked about, but if it's not working, do seek professional help. Thanks for watching. Do let me know if there are any other topics you'd like summarized. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Till next time, stay healthy.